Would you pray with me? Oh, gracious God, we need you every hour. And we thank you because you're with us every minute. So bless us now as we prepare to hear your word. Hide me behind the shadow of the cross that it's your word, your voice, your good news that is proclaimed. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, amen. How long will you go limping between two opinions? Some translations put it, how long will you go hopping between two choices? That's what Elijah said to the people in Israel. How long? How long will you go? I mean, if the Lord is God, serve him. But if Baal is God, serve him. This divided alliance, allegiance, isn't working. And the analogy for him was, he was thinking about birds actually. Because he was seeing birds, and if you've ever watched birds hop from branch to branch, like they can't quite get settled. They go one branch and then they jump to another and then they jump to another. And that was the thought. And he's watching them and saying, watching the birds, thinking about the birds and saying to the people, how long? And I think it's a word that probably is fitting for us in this day and age. Because we're sort of a fickle people when you get right down to it. I mean, there are times in our lives when we're looking for God, when we're searching and seeking for God. I mean, let something go wrong in your life. And then you're like, please, God, please, 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 please. Amen. Mm -hmm. Or let somebody get sick. And you need a healing, you need a blessing, and you're like, please, God, please, please, please. Or there are certain times in our lives when we're looking for God, right? A baby is born, and we want to dedicate the baby to God. Or we get married, and we want to have God bless the wedding. Or when we die... We want assurance that God will take the souls of our beloved and keep that soul with them for all eternity. Amen. Those are times when we look for God. But a day like today, oh, we're not thinking too much about God. And as, as Yolanda sort of busted you out, even if you are, you're like, oh, boy, it's hot here. God is good, but we're fickle. How long will you go hopping between the opinions? How long will you sort of hold on to God, but hold on to other things as well? Because that's the other aspect of it. Even if we are thinking about God, we sort of spread out our markers. You know, I, I trust God, but I really feel good that I got some money in the bank. I believe in God, but I feel so much better because I got a little something, something in the lay-by. I love the Lord. But today, what I really love is to be outside. How long? How long? 
to Elijah in this showdown demonstrates to us that or we can put our hope and trust in other things but those other things don't come through in the end that's what we see in our sermon scripture 450 prophets of Baal going around Raising a fuss, raising a commotion, cutting themselves, crying out, and for what? Nothing happens. And I love Elijah, because he says, well, you know, cry out a little louder. Maybe he's sleeping, that's it. Or he's gone on a journey. Maybe he's meditating. Cry out a little longer. Cry out a little louder. And I think he'd probably say the same thing to us. You know, that we make gods out of people in our lives, or making gods out of our children, or our parents, making gods out of the job, or the money, or, or the, the, the security that we've somehow put aside. And when things get tough and hard, and those things aren't really paying forth any dividends, couldn't you hear Elijah say, well, cry out a little louder. What's the matter? That child that you raised, have they grown up and left? What, that, that husband or that wife that you built a whole life with, are they gone now? That house that you bought, are you upside down in your mortgage? All that stock that you had is now written off because it's worthless. Cry out a little louder. Aren't those things gone? Now, as we've already established, this is a lesson for Vacation Bible School. And you got to love lessons like this because they are the stuff and things of VBS. Sunday school. I mean, adventure and action. I mean, what a wonderful showdown that we have, you know? The prophets of Baal and one single prophet of the Lord of Israel. And they're going at it, head to head. You sort of hear, Sunday, 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 Sunday. <laughs> Nobody else watched those? <laughs> But what you recognize on closer inspection is that this is a story that offers a lesson for us, a process, if you will, for sacrifice. And it makes it really useful for us to hear as adults this process for sacrifice, more than just the showdown. Do you want to hear about the process? Yeah? Yes. You're sort of captive. You might as well say yes. Because Elijah would say then, come closer to me. The first thing, and it might be helpful. Grab your Bibles. Amen. Amen. I like the idea of using a Bible in church, what a, what a concept, right? Kings might take you a little longer, so I'll wait for you to flip pages. First Kings 18. And I want you to look at the 30th verse. Because you want to hear and see what the process looks like. The first step of the process at verse 30, it says, he repaired the altar. That's the first thing that Elijah 
has to do. He has to repair the altar. And it makes sense because see, Ahab was so busy worshiping Baal, so busy erecting Asherah poles that he had allowed God's place of worship, the altar, to fall into disrepair. And, and, and Elijah said, you know, the first thing I need to do is repair the altar in order to have God be present. See, the altar, the significance, the theological significance of an altar is that it commemorates a place where God shows himself. And oftentimes, they erected altars after God had appeared. But here is Elijah hoping that God will come and show himself at this place. And so he says, I need to have this right and in order, in order for God to come and appear. And what it says for us in this process is that every now and then, when we want to have a relationship with God, we want to have the presence of God in our lives, we need to repair our altars. We need to repair and restore our relationship with God in order that the presence of God might dwell in us. Do you understand what I'm saying? We need to repair our relationships. I mean, sometimes we allow the altars of our heart to sort of get grown over. I have a we. I do we fit. And the thing is brutal sometimes. Because if you don't exercise regularly enough, and you turn it on and you select your little me and I'll say something snide like, oh, Deborah, you're back? It's been 43 days <laughs> or something ridiculous. And then you get on the scale and then it treats you even worse. <laughs> but sometimes our relationship with God is like that. I mean, have you found sometimes that your prayer life is so dry that you might see God saying, oh, you're back? <sighs> what? How long has it been since you've prayed? We need to restore that relationship so that he hears from us and that we make time to hear from him. But Elijah does something else that it says in that 30th verse, 31st. He takes 12 stones according to the number of tribes and he assembles them as part of the altar. And that speaks a word to us about restoring relationship with one another. We gotta be connected. We gotta be together in unity. I'm so glad this morning that the Spirit got on me and made me turn around and reestablish a relationship. Because in doing so, I know I won a brother and a sister and a family as God would want it to be. We have to restore the relationship, and that's the altar. Now, now you have to understand the other thing, there's, there's a little more to the significance of the altar. Yes, it is the place of presence of God, but if you translate the word, the Hebrew verb, that is most commonly associated with our word altar is slaughtering place. That's what the altar is, a slaughtering place. It is the place to slaughter the sacrifice. Now, I know most of us would say, well, what is it that we have to slaughter? What would we have to slaughter? Well, that's where we would 
reference the Torah. Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 16. It says, therefore, circumcise your heart. What we slaughter is our hearts. And see, what we're supposed to do is cut away the hard part. You know, the part that is stubborn, the part that is inflexible, the part that is willful. We're supposed to cut that away. And you know, it makes sense when you think about slaughtering. Because what's the first thing that the priest would do and have the family who's bringing the sacrifice do with the animal for slaughtering? They would skin it. Now, I'm not trying to be gross. But you think about it, they were taking off that outer covering so that the tenderest part could be offered up to God. We are to slaughter our hearts, cutting away that which is hard and inflexible to offer up the tenderest parts of ourselves on the altar of sacrifice. That's the second thing that we have to do. After we've repaired the altar, we've got to cut away our heart, what is inflexible, and offer it up to God. Follow me? Now, after you've cut away and offered up, what has to happen? The priest accepts. The offering. And that's what you're seeing in verse 33. See, Elijah is acting in the capacity of the priest. Now, the cool thing about this is that we too have a priest, a high priest, who's accepting our offering. That high priest is none other than Jesus Christ. He's accepting our offering. He's the one who's interceding for us. In fact, he made the ultimate sacrifice for us. So that he can accept our sacrifice to God. Now, That gets you part of the way. Elijah then does something interesting in this narrative. He has workers pour water all over the sacrifice. Now, some of us might wonder, well, what was that about? Was he just trying to show how God is able. And yeah, there's some of that. I mean, this is what you see in verse 33, right? Fill four jars with water and pour it on the burnt offering on the wood. Do it a second time. See, you got to understand that there were charlatans operating even in that day. People who were good at sleight of hand. Right, guys? And what they would do with the sleight of hand, is that they would have this altar set up. But underneath the altar, they would create a trench where there was an actual fire burning. And they would have this sort of lever system that even after they poured the water on it, the, the levers would close up and cover up where the fire was. And they could open up the levers and allow the fire to come up. And it would look like... They had started a fire even though they had poured water over it. But it was a trick. It was a magician's act. And because that had been done in those days, Elijah said, no, no, we're not going to do that. We're going to make sure that everybody knows that this is really drenched. Dig trenches around it, fill it with water so that there's no mistaking the fact that this is God. Now, in a very real sense, we, as the sacrifice, our hearts, 
as the sacrifice have been drenched as well. What are we drenched with? Oh, there's, there's what, but bless you. How's the song go? There's a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. And sinners plunge beneath the flood, lose all their guilty stains. We are drenched with the blood of the Lamb, but we're also drenched with the waters of his sacrifice. Because remember when Jesus was on the cross and they, they, they poked him with the spear, pierced him with the spear to see if he was really dead. And when they pierced him in the side, the blood and the water came streaming out. We're effectively drenched in that sacrifice. But then after we've been drenched in that sacrifice, we're drenched in the waters of baptism. I mean, because that's what we do in baptism. We symbolize outwardly what's already happened inside of us. And we take to the waters of baptism where we're drenched again. And then the drenching happens each and every time you sit under the word because what it says in the word is that we're washed in the waters of the word. So we are drenched. We are drenched. And that drenching is continual. Just like the workers pouring the water over the sacrifice multiple times. And you sort of think, well, well, how could fire start with all that water? With all that water. But that's where the power of prayer happens. Because you know it's not us. It's God. And God has promised that extraordinary things will happen through ordinary people when we allow ourselves just to be the intercessors of God's will. Elijah's prayer was 63 words long. 63 words. And that's significant because you had 450 people dancing around a sacrifice, yelling and screaming, crying out for hours, cutting themselves to no avail. But one man prayed 63 words. And the power of God descended. And the cool thing about that fire that came down from heaven, it came down from heaven and it ignited and consumed the sacrifice first. It, it burned up the sacrifice first and then burned the wood and burned the rocks and burned everything from the top down. So no one could say there was a trick. Nothing had come up from the bottom. It burned from the top down. And you know, when I think about that fire coming down in that way, I can't help but think about the acts of the apostles on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came down and ignited, landed like tongues of fire on each of the people that were assembled and all of a sudden they started praising God. We see fire can consume, but fire can also fill us. And allow us to praise God with power. And we see the process in totality. That as we repair our altars, repair the relationship we have with God, but then repair relationships that we have with one another. As we offer up the sacrifice, cutting away that which is hard and offering the tenderest part to God. As our priest accepts the sacrifice on our behalf, as we are drenched in the waters, the fire 
which is the Holy Spirit, can come onto our hearts anew and dwell in us. And let me tell you something. When that process is complete, everybody sees it. I mean, you can literally glow with the anointing of God. Where people know, and they, they might not even be able to articulate it, but they say there, there's something about you. I remember Matt's prayer. Talking about well, what, what must I do? I, something about you. I want to be like that. I don't even know what that is, but I know I want it. It's the power of the Holy Spirit when you go through the process. And you know what? There's only one response to that. It's joy. It's joy. It's praise. I mean, look at what happened in the narrative. When the people saw how the fire had come and consumed everything, I mean, they fell on their faces and started praising God, saying, there's no God like Jehovah. There's nobody like our God. Nobody could do that for us like him the 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 bales weren't any good the asherahs weren't any good the husband or the wife that you might put your stock in they're not gonna cut it the children are not gonna cut it the money you have is not gonna cut it the house that you bought is not gonna cut it it's nothing but God nobody can save you nobody can change you as Andre Crouch said can't nobody do me like Jesus it's only him. And we have to praise him because of what he's done. Worship him because of what he's doing. Acknowledge him because no one can save us like he can. It's what happens as we follow the process and what results is joy. Amen? Amen.